Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Strangelove, Dr. Frankenstein, these epitomize how we view scientists and mathematicians. And while we've stripped them of their lab coats and their sidekicks, we still imagine that most scientists, most of them are men, they work late into the night, they're strange, they're odd, and in the end, they're crazy. And if we don't believe that, we tend to pick them out as nerds who are really difficult to manage at dinner parties. <laughs> the funny thing about this is when we're little, we are all scientists. We all explore, we all discover, we all investigate. But if we do this into adulthood, we must be nut jobs. Now I'll give you that some of this stereotype has basis in reality. Wallace Hume Carruthers, one of the giants of science, he created what was probably some of the most important materials of the 20th century. It's 1930 and it's getting harder and harder to get natural silk and natural rubber. So there was a huge push to create synthetic analogs. You can imagine World War II is on the horizon. You're starting to think you might need some of these things. And so he set about doing this. Now to give you some sense of how difficult this is, we didn't know what the structure of these materials was, were. We weren't even really getting handle on what these materials were like until the 1950s. It was in the 50s that we discovered the structure of DNA. And yet he was going to make them anyways. And he did. He made synthetic silk and synthetic rubber. His discoveries helped parachutists survive in World War II. They became the basis of an entire industry, and they are the critical materials of probably the most important device of modern times, Spanx. <laughs> <laughs> Wallace Carruthers wrote to one of his really good friends, if I can make synthetic silk, I will have done enough for one lifetime. And he took his life long before he knew the impact of his work. So madness exists, but that's not the whole story. That's Wallace, but he didn't do this alone. He did this with a team of people. Wallace Carruthers collaborated with Elmer Bolton to develop the precursors to these materials. Arnold Collins and Julian Hill worked with him to actually make these materials and recognizing that in order to really move this field forward, you had to actually understand the basis of these materials. He worked with Paul Flory to develop the mathematical models for this. Paul Flory won the Nobel Prize for this work, but the Nobel Prize isn't given posthumously. Now, I loved science. I wanted to be a scientist, but this idea of mad scientist was hugely off-putting. Did I have to be crazy to do science? If I did science, was it going to be crazy? <laughs> if I did science, was I ever going to get a date? Because in all honesty, I was a teenager, a nerd or not, I needed a date. <laughs> But knowing that I could work with other people changed it and made it a little bit less scary. And so I went to college to be an engineer so that I could learn about science and apply it to big problems. And I convinced myself I'd be fine. I could do it all. This was going to be great. And then engineering threw at me thermo and kinetics and transport, and I was screwed. But I survived because all my friends were in the same boat, and we helped each other, and we taught each other and that's how we made it through. So I liked it well enough that I decided to go to grad school. And grad school is primarily about research, but part of grad school is you have to take classes. And where I went, we had to minor in something outside of our discipline. Now most people minor in business, it's practical, but it sounded awfully dull at the time. So I looked down the list of acceptable minors and saw playwriting and signed up. And I showed up at my first playwriting class and was told that I had to work in the theater. And so I showed up. Theater is the greatest gift you can ever give an aspiring scientist. <laughs> because theater is dreaming realized. I watched people come together with ideas about stories and lights and sound. And I watched them make something that was not only bigger than what they dreamed of, but what any could dream of. I was hooked. I wanted to do science like this. I started reading about geniuses and studying them a little bit on the side, dreaming maybe. And one of the things I came to realize is that while geniuses are phenomenal, there isn't a single one that does what they do on their own. Genius isn't inborn. Genius is created through collaboration. 
Genius is getting outside of the norms, the expectations, the perceptions. It's incredibly difficult and it takes tons of courage. But what it takes more than anything, more than anything at all, is a team. This is my team. This is my collaborator, Jenny, and some of our students at UMBC. I am lucky beyond all measure because I work with phenomenal people and we are taking on a huge problem. We're interested in trying to figure out ways to protect and repair the brain and spinal cord after injury. And one of the things that we've taken on is that we've started to ask the question of what happens if you can stop the bleeding in the brain after injury? But the problem is there's nothing to stop the bleeding. The biggest reason that young people will die is they'll bleed out. And yet we have zilch, nada, to stop internal bleeding. So we decided to make something. My lab consists of chemists, chemical engineers, environmental engineers, mechanical engineers, hematologists, pathologists, and one woman whose degree is in Italian. But she turns out she's phenomenal at making materials. And we're not just scientists, including the Italian person. We're photographers. <laughs> we're photographers. We're artists. We're painters. We're dancers. Some of them are. And we're two beer makers, which I have to say is fundamental to doing good science. <laughs> and our families and friends get sucked into it, because science doesn't just happen nine to five. And so they all become part of a team. I hate the mad scientist. I despise it. It's neither accurate or inspiring. We're teams. That's how all scientists work, whether they tell you that or not. And we have to be a team to make this happen. I can promise you that I don't know if our material will ultimately work in humans, but I am absolutely and utterly sure that we wouldn't have gotten to this point if it wasn't for the fact that we have a whole team. What we're actually making are nanoparticles that are injected in the bloodstream after injury. When you have an injury, you have platelets, and these platelets become activated. And they start to reach out and try to grab onto the tissue and try to grab onto each other to form a wall to stop the bleeding. It's like Red Rover on steroids. <laughs> and what we've created are little particles that are part of this team. There isn't a single one of us, no matter how brilliant, that could have done that on their own. It took all of us coming together. The other reason that I hate the mad scientists so much is that it convinces people that they can't be that, that they can't be part of this. I have a two-year-old son, and when he goes out into the garden and he investigates every single rock, every single insect, he looks at the stars and knows every one, and he develops hypotheses and he tests them. Very recently, he proved conclusively that we still cannot fly. <laughs> yeah. He's a scientist. And we all have that still in our fabric. Every single one of you has that in your fabric, to be curious, to wonder, to question. But you also have this voice that tells you, you can't do that. You can't understand that. I know, because I've talked with some of you. And I've heard that said a few times. But the thing is, that voice is wrong. You need to tell it to sit down and be quiet, because you can. Not because you're crazy and not because you're a genius, but because we're all in this together. We all teach each other and we all learn from each other. And that's the thing. That's why this is so frustrating that we have this stereotype. So we need to break the stereotype down. Theater is dreaming realized. I want to see us realize the possibilities for what we all can do and what we all can make. If we can do that, together, you and us and everyone can make the next great nylon, maybe the next great vaccine, or maybe sail beyond the stars. But we all need to be in it together. Thank you. <laughs>